Hello, Edible Acres community. I am broadcasting to you from the Edible Acres headquarters. I'll show a little behind the scenes shot of what this actually is, but let's pretend it's a nice studio. Um, anyway, I put a video up a few days ago with the concept of community consultation. Very brief overview. I'll, I'll link here in case you're interested in, in hearing me describe it in more detail. But basically, it's like micro consultation. Folks reach out, um, throw a little tip my way to recognize my time and energy to put towards answering their question directly and submit a question. And in this format, what I'd like to do is go through, uh, so far there have been five really nice questions, some simple, some complex, and try to answer them in uh, to the best of my ability. I will make sure the question is clearly on the screen somewhere uh, for you to read. It'll also be all the details in the description. I'm going to encourage folks here um, listen to these answers that I'm putting forward and add more to it in the comments. Help these folks out. You know, we can use this as a community space. Like if I offer up an idea and you say, you know what? Yeah, that's fine. But what about this instead? Or Sean is way wrong. Here's the way I think things ought to go. I would love to have that for these people. Um, it's an opportunity for for me to share the whatever it is that I know and to have the community augment that or modify that. So without further ado, I'm going to hop right into it and try to start answering some of these questions. So stick around. While I'm recording this, you might hear some sounds in the background. We do have five cats and two dogs. Uh, you might hear, you might see some wiggling on the table. That's our large cat Stanley walking across the table. And you might hear a baby and Sasha. That's little baby Zelda and Sasha. So I'm just filming this in the evening while we're doing dinner things and all the other things. So if there's distractions that happen in this or other videos along this line, please bear with us. This is a, a scrim of a studio in our very full little home. The first question that we got came from Daniel. I'm going to read an abridged version of it here, but I'll put it up on the screen if you want to read it in detail. And it's basically, um, currently live in deep East Texas. If I were going to relocate from the deep South, where would I go to establish a permaculture food and forest homestead? I mean, I've got my very limited scope of what it is that I know and work with. I've been in central New York state in the Finger Lakes area since 2005. Um, coming from that, from that experience, I would offer that finding a place that is the least climate brittle in that could it be a space that if it were to get warmer, it would be tolerable. If it were to get a bit colder, you could still work within that context and it would be tolerable. More rain, less rain, that it would feel comfortable enough, uh, that you're near ample fresh water. Those sorts of things would be the starting place. I like the idea of personally being buffered a bit by large bodies of water not being too, too far in order to shield from the intensity of the coldest winter winds, the coldest intense uh, moments of winter, which can draw a space down. It can really desiccate and create extremely low, challenging temperatures to work with. I would also personally avoid being very, very close to the ocean it's much more expensive, but also it feels as though the ocean gets, as the ocean gets warmer, a fair bit of the regions near there seem to be getting much more intense um, rain events and weather events. This is a question where I feel like the highest value would come from the community. I'm going to invite people to suggest places that they would think of uh, as being uh, reasonable, stable, climactically resilient in the face of whatever it is that's happening here climate-wise. Things are definitely changing. Where we are, it gets warmer and warmer. It feels like every year in the winter, we flip a coin as far as uh, whether or not we get a lot of rain or very little rain in the summer months. However, it's tolerable and it's really navigable because this is a particular area that when it is hotter, it's pretty darn hot for us, but it never really gets above 100 Fahrenheit for that long, if at all. In the cold of the winter, a very cold moment might be just that, a moment, but it's not profound and prolonged cold, at least as of yet. Uh, on the years that we get excessive rain, it is still navigable with tree-centered systems and a pretty wide range of plants that we're working with, at least for us with the nursery the last um, 
18 or so years as each season feels as though it's different than the one before. Um, it feels as though it's still navigable. We can get wetter, we could get drier, we could get hotter, colder, and it still works for us. So what are the places that seem to have that picture? Um, but I like the Finger Lakes in New York, uh, New York State, but that's also just what I know. I think you could also consider looking up into Canada if that's of interest. Um, but I think that might be the extent of what I've got to offer there. I think the community would be able to give you a much more broad experience. Where do folks live um, in a cooler, more moist climate than Texas that they feel has extremely high levels of resilience moving into an unraveling climactic future? Um, I love the Finger Lakes. Hey, if you ever show up around here, let's, let's connect. For the second question, we have a special guest, sweet little Zelda. Sasha is in the midst of feeding the animals, and so our sweet, tender little friend here, Zelda, is going to join us for this one. Um, it comes to us from Gilly, who's a member of our physical local community. Hi there, Gilly. Nice to see you, or nice to see your question. Hello, Zelda. Um, is black locust sawdust safe to use in a chicken composting system? That is a good question. I think if... Uh, if I were to be using exclusively black locust sawdust in a chicken system, I would have some concerns with that. Zelda would as well, it seems. Um, personally, if I had um, just black locust or just black walnut fine sawdust, my preference would be to let it dry and then consider turning it into charcoal. Um, it's really high BTU, good energy density, and you could, uh, if somebody in the community has a wood stove, maybe you have a wood stove and you wanted to turn into charcoal, that fine charcoal powder added to a chicken composting system I can speak directly to as being really um, reasonable, really productive. It's super affirming to red wigglers. I don't fully understand why, but when we add high quality charcoal made from our wood stove, crushed up a bit, the black locust sawdust would be really, really fine. It promotes uh, red wigglers amazingly in the compost. Zelda, do you have any thoughts to add? Okay, so that's something to consider when it comes to that sawdust. Um, when we're using other hardwoods like sugar maple, oak, uh, ash, I don't really think about it too much. I think if you didn't have a ways to make um, charcoal out of the locust, I would certainly use it, but I think there'd be higher value in turning it into that charcoal. It'd be more absorbent. I think it would render out the weird antifungal stuff and the strange aromas that black locust tends to offer and may work nicely. So hopefully that's helpful to you, and I hope your chicken composting system is thriving. I look forward to seeing you in the spring, probably. The next question came from a person who didn't share their name, and that's completely fine. I'm going to put it up right here. You can pause the video to, to read that if you'd like, but the basic gist of it is they live in an urban context. They, along with their neighbors, are trying to figure out ways of establishing some design in the walkways, the, the sidewalks around their living space that help encourage people to slow down and interact more. There was a sweet sentiment at the end. It's basically you know, in permaculture, there's the idea of slow spread and sink, which is for water and how water moves through a landscape. And they acknowledged uh, trying to create some designs that help people slow down and spread out. Maybe not sink, but slow down at least and interact more with the landscape around them. It's a really compelling question and a really neat... Well, first of all, I want to say I appreciate that you and your neighbors are thinking about things in that way. The idea of helping people to slow down a little bit and interact with each other more seems incredibly thoughtful and healthy. I think along with that, there's, um, God, there's so much, there's a lot to think about and share with that. There needs to be an acknowledgement that for many people, they might not really have the time to slow down and interact. So making sure that whatever design solutions you create um, allow for folks that just need to make a beeline through that space to do so. Maybe a little bit in the spirit of like, if there's a really intense torrential rain, you do need to have allowances for those pulse moments where water can be shunted um, without damaging things or without interacting too, too much. But 
in the spirit of slowing folks down, I, I remember a bunch of years ago, some folks that lived in downtown Ithaca, they had like an anarchist household um, where they had, uh, I worked with them to create these big garden beds in the front. Um, we made a design decision that was poor at the time. We added stinging nettles because they wanted to have extra nourishment there and people did not like that. Um, but the idea of having raised, physically raised beds, like is it with logs um, or interesting pieces of lumber, something aesthetically pleasing? Is it with salvaged bricks that are carefully and thoughtfully put together like an herb spiral, but something that creates a three dimensionality in the soil near the walkways that could be visually compelling and also visually a little bit more complex might draw in the eye of people that are passing by. Um, I think a little bit about a, a cob bench that folks made at that house um, that did not block the sidewalk at all, but invited people to sit down and interact with the space a little bit. It was a community project where they used salvage materials. It was all natural. I think at this point it kind of washed back into the earth, um, but they did, they got no resistance from folks in making that. And um, I remember seeing lots of folks sit there. So. You know, it could even be simply lawn chairs that are out and about or that are leaned up against someone's house with an invitation, like open them up and sit down if you want to talk with people and they can be put away afterwards. I think a bit about aromatics. What would it look like to plant uh, different varieties of thyme and oregano right next to the sidewalk so that they can gently slowly creep in and with foot traffic, once in a while, somebody steps on one. It's a good, hardy, perennial, um, tromping, resistant plant that would release an interesting aroma that might help pause someone for a moment and wonder, like, what is that amazing smell? Um, and slow them down and have a chance for them to read the little signage, like, oh, this is a you know an herb that can resist foot traffic, but is also used for these medicines, and you can make a tea. Um, you know, anise hyssop is another great example. You brush against it and all of a sudden things smell like uh, beautiful licorice. I keep looking down because I've got my cat on my lap. We get different, different beings at different times of day. Uh, right now it's early morning. Um, anise hyssop, bronze fennel, strikingly beautiful plant that is also fully edible and medicinal and releases a nice aroma when you interact with it. So those are some thoughts. I wonder about uh, low thorniness raspberries or strawberries that can be planted that are extremely easy to recognize sweet, simple, delicious, almost universally enjoyed fruits. You know, I, you know, I think black currant and honeyberry and seaberry because I really like those plants, but those aren't plants that people would necessarily know are fruit or are food. Um, and maybe those are nice to have elsewhere, but. Um, yeah, the simple, delicious, easy, sweet-smelling beings that could be right in association with those walkways and physical interaction uh, or opportunity to sit in the form of either a permanent cob bench that maybe has pockets where there's soil on the side and herbs pouring out something fun, completely natural, completely easy to break down, or more portable, mobile in the form of chairs that can be brought out and put away periodically, and the idea of three-dimensional beds that can help draw the eye in and add more complexity. But again, not blocking people from walking, but invite that slower interaction. We think of the solution to fast-moving water being swales, which are basically like literal physical speed bumps for water. Instead of going over them, it spreads them across the landscape. Um, what can do that visually for people? And again, invitation there, folks in the comments, please share your thoughts about how these kind, thoughtful people can help their community slow down, interact more with the landscape and also with each other. That's a thoughtful question. Thanks for sharing that. This question comes from Frankie, which I'll put off to the side here. And it reads, apples. I'm hoping for the first harvest on my three apple trees, Brayburn and Cortland, um, zone six and six to seven hours of sun. They all have some pretty nasty rust on them and when they leaf out. It's affecting my younger pear trees too. Um, I believe I'll still get fruit, but can I manage this organically? Pick worst affected leaves off. Uh, preference is not to spray, but considering copper, can you share your thoughts? Um, 
Yeah, so I want to be very clear. I don't have deep technical knowledge of like, well, this is, uh, these are the organic spraying protocols, and yes, copper is safe, and this is how you can use it, or copper is not. Um, my leaning, my strong leaning is, yeah, wouldn't it be nice just to keep the sprays to a minimum or just not use them at all? Again, if there's wiggling, I've got a cat on the table washing themselves right now. Um, it's, let's see, my, my own direct experience with this is, um, yes, we, we see uh, apple cedar rust. We see rust on different plants. It feels as though with most of the apple trees we're growing, they seem to be able to handle it without um, much problem. The idea of pulling off leaves, I think you can do that. I don't think I've ever personally done that. It's a fungal load. I wonder what does it look like to have more um, antifungal allies in association with the trees? To, to me, the lowest hanging fruit would be some sort of allium uh, planted right at the base of the trees. I mean, it's a, a small solution, and it, would it have a deep impact right away? Almost certainly not, but in the long run, would it help a bit? Maybe. Uh, it's certainly beautiful, and it certainly would not hurt if it doesn't help. Um, I think of chives or walking onions or even just simply garlic planted around the base. Side benefit there is they would confer some level of protection from uh, mice and voles chewing the base of the trunk of the trees. Um, the mentha clan is beautiful, aromatic, useful, and also can be antimicrobial, antifungal at times. So, you know, the oreganos, the mints, those sorts of characters, and um, thinking in that way. I, so that's, you know, thinking about supporting through direct antifungal associates next to the tree. I think you could explore um, the idea of aerobic foliar feeds in the form of compost tea. Uh, is there comfrey? Is there nettle? Uh, com uh, compost teas that could be applied to those trees. I've understood people using uh, tea from horsetail, which has an immense amount of silica available um, to help support, you know, as, as a foliar feed to help support the leaves. Of, it's a disease, or it's an infection that um, is going to happen periodically, but it feels like it's driven by nutrition deficiencies in the soil or like health challenges that are innately in the plant. So how can we boost them? So a little bit in the spirit of not to say antibiotics are this hot, bad thing, blah, 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 but it wouldn't be the place to begin in my mind. It would be if a person is unhealthy and expressing, showing these pictures of disease, what would it look like to really boost, make sure their hydration needs are met, that they've got good clean air around them, that there's good airflow. So pruning to open up within the tree at appropriate times of year. Um, the sun access sounds like that's decent, so good, healthy sun on the skin or on the leaves. Um, but then also deep, deep nourishment, which takes a little while to help push the picture in a better direction. But, you know, I would want to have like bone broth and chicken soup and burdock root soups and things like that if I was feeling like I was expressing a disease picture or a, a health challenge. And so those compost teas might be able to do that. It could be soil soaks. It could be the foliar feeds. Um, and then also thinking about who are the tree options that are innately immune to those uh, pressures. So, for example, um, there is a patch of dog rose at our six-acre site that every year has those big puffy cedar rust, um, I don't know, like, galls or something like that. I don't know the exact technical term, but they're loaded with them every year. Uh, they still do make some fruit, but they're definitely not super happy. Right next to them is an apple tree. That's a variety called Red Free. A friend gave me a grafted Red Free apple tree way back when. And by all accounts, that should just be loaded with that same disease picture, but it doesn't have it. It's just a, a naturally immune to that particular rust. Um, so seeking those out when you move forward, if you're adding more plants into the landscape, it seems like Asian pears tend to seem to do quite well with uh, resisting disease picture. And then thinking beyond that, 
outside of the rose family entirely. So what would it look like to add persimmons into the mix, to add gumi into the mix, like completely different uh, beings from outside that just simply do not carry that disease picture. So that if that continues to evolve and get harder and harder on the trees or they need to be cut down someday, then you've got that resilience and that diversity of other plant beings that don't host the disease and also are not affected by it. Um, so those are just some thoughts, again, in the comments. What do folks do for apple cedar rust uh, pressures that is thoughtful, ethical, maybe low cost, maybe low embodied energy? If you do use sprays, commercial sprays and things like that, what have you found works so that you can help this person out? Thank you for the question. So a question from Ocean State Food Forest right here. I'd like to convert half acre of pine forest into food forest. Any advice? Interesting uh, challenge to work through and also something that I have some direct experience with. Our six acre site uh, was loaded to the brim with uh, Scots pine that I cleared over, not entirely by any stretch, but cleared some uh, glades within that context, quarter acre and half acre glades. And some of the things that I did with that, so I did not have a uh, sawmill. I think if I had a sawmill on site and easily available, I would lean towards the idea of turning a fair bit of the trees into usable lumber. That seems like a nice way to um, have respect for the tree, fold them into things where their carbon can be persistent for the long haul um, to, to build with them. It seems thoughtful. Uh, but what I would do, what I did, is I basically cut the logs into manageable lengths and I laid them out into the base of hugel mounds to, to cover with soil and allow to break down over time. That's something to consider for if you are using the uh, mill, that the slab wood, the offcuts or sections of logs that have holes or rot in them um, on contour, laying them out and then putting soil on top from upslope to slowly break down over time could be a nice way to kind of sweep them under the rug and fold that carbon into the landscape for the long haul. Um, personally, I don't own a chipper. I don't think that I would seek one out. If you have one, fine, go for it. I probably would recommend, um, it seems worth considering this, not using a wood chipper, but rather uh, in the winter months, if you're, that's when you're doing the felling work, that's when I would be doing it because I have the time and it just, it's physically very vigorous. I want to wear lots of protective gear and in the winter that facilitates that. Um, I would dig cone pit method uh, biochar production pits. And I've spoken about this if you search biochar on our channel, but you can also search other places. There's a, web, um, a YouTuber called Skill Cult. If you search cone pit trench method on YouTube. You can find some neat videos where he talks about basically digging these conical pits in the earth that then are in a trench form that allow you to take entire branches of trees and render them into charcoal. There's an art to it. You'd want to start small. You want to have nice piles of bone dry dead stuff in one area, greener things in another area so you can mix them. You'd want to make sure you have tons of water available. Um, but there's a couple things about that that I think are beneficial. Pine chips are an acidifying material uh, in an already pine dominant space that you're opening up. Adding wood chips of pine is going to continue that um, acid state. And I think if you wanted to have the opportunity of growing a wider range of plants, you'd want some alkalinity, you'd want the pH to go up a bit and cooking those branches, turning them predominantly into charcoal for biochar, but having some ash would probably have good benefit in bringing the soil pH to a more neutral state. So there could be some benefit there. Maybe there's a blended um, potential there of some charcoal production, some wood chip making. I think having, and so then that charcoal you'd want to consider bringing to your composting system, if you have animals, if you have humanure or things like that, uh, breaking up the charcoal and allowing it to get inoculated with nutrient. You could also uh, have troughs where you add compost or urine or both and water and put the charcoal in and let it sit for a while to just like draw in tons of nutrient before it's applied to the beds. 
But charcoal just is an amazing ingredient to add to a young food forest, in my opinion. That's great that you're thinking of adding in trees that you've grown in air prune boxes. Awesome. Definitely strongly recommend considering uh, that nitrogen fixers are part of your design process. Woody nitrogen fixers that can be chop and dropped because pine forest, um, what I've observed is that the soil pines are beautiful. They're wonderful beings and also they tend to, at least in our landscapes, make the soil a drier and a little bit less verdant and rich and nice for having been there. And so if you're leaving the stumps, you're leaving the soil as is, having early succession pioneer species that can facilitate soil growth, they can start really kickstarting nitrogen being reintroduced, uh, fast green manure production, those sorts of plants, really, really useful. Uh, if you're a similar climate to us, my thoughts would go to River locust or Amorpha fruticosa, extremely easy from seed, super fast growing, they're thornless, so they're amenable to chop and drop and being used all around. Uh, if it's a wetter area, alder can be a really fast growing nitrogen fixer that you can chop and drop wildly. Um, autumn olive and gumi are fruit producing and nitrogen fixing and amenable to chop and drop. Um, and then you get into the realm of things like black locust and honey locust, which are great canopy trees, but might want to be, you'd be careful around the thorniness and the suckering habit of those plants. But consider the, the nitrogen fixers as a key part of that and consider dynamic accumulators, um, the horseradish, your comfrey, your rhubarb, deep tap-rooted broad-leafed plants that can be put on the edges of your tree planting beds to help get down below where the root systems of those pines were and start drawing up some of the mineral that's down in the earth, some of the humidity that's down in the earth and bringing it up into this new landscape. Um, those are some thoughts that come to my mind. Would love to have, again, as always, uh, comments down there. Do, is anyone else on a, a, a sloped site converting from a pine dominant context into a diverse food forest. What are some of the strategies that you've used that you found to be really helpful? Um, it's an interesting um, idea and a, a, a challenge. It's somewhat specific, but I imagine being a, a consistent theme for a lot of people. But definitely I can say the need to dig out the stumps is not something I've experienced. I made a video about that way back when I just plant trees right in the root flares of, of felled trees and we've got beautiful plums and hickory and peaches and chestnuts that are within two feet of two foot diameter pines that were cut down and they all are doing great. Boy, that cat is really cleaning himself up, buddy. Okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and that's what I've got. That brings us to a close on the first round of community consultations. I thought those were some fantastic questions. Thank you for those. Um, I am hopeful that I offered enough value that it feels worthwhile for those of you that did do the tip thing and, and shared those questions. But please let me know. I'd love some feedback. Is it felt, did it feel a little lean? Could there have been a more um, thoughtfulness or more material to wrap around with my answer? Uh, can I have improved in some way? Please let me know. Um, would you like more details on uh, my thoughts and my answer to your question? Share it in the comments below. I'll keep an eye on those and try to add some more detail as needed or as requested. And then again, of course, the community, you can fill this out and just have lots of great dialogue. I like the idea of some of these videos acting as um, like an informal, thoughtful, pleasant forum you know here's this video that talks about these ideas and then the real content is down in the comments and it feels like a lot of videos naturally are doing that but just consider this an explicit invitation to do so if you really liked this um, this idea and you want to see more of it let me know if you want to uh, share a question you can just do so in the, the chat some folks have been really generous in sharing financial support. So I'm happy to just try to be helpful in a written way as much as possible. Uh, if you would like this video format of an answer and you feel like this was worthwhile, I have the link here 
and in the description um, through PayPal, if that's all right by you, would be, I'm asking five to 25 bucks. Uh, it can be less if you need it to be. It can be like a dollar, that's cool. Um, and I will do my best to do another round of these if there's interest. Otherwise, thanks and take care, goodbye.